I want you to imagine what Christmas would be like with zero music, like none. So Christmas worship, no music. Like driving in your car, no music. Driving to your relative's house. A lot of times when we like to go home for Christmas, we have music on in the, ra- in the radio and it gets us excited about it. Nothing. Completely silent. Maybe for some of you, you're like, that would be a blessing. But imagine even like Christmas movies without the soundtracks. Like it's just off, right? It doesn't, it doesn't seem to work. It just wouldn't be the same. Because like it or not, music is a huge part of the Christmas season. For some, it brings comfort. It can inspire joy, perhaps both. For many, it gets them in the mood for the season. It seems incomplete without it. Music brings back memories. You hear certain songs and you remember things. We, Corey and I both have al- certain albums that... We remember as kids, so when we hear the, that music, when he hears the Osmond Family Christmas album, when I hear the Christmas portrait album by the Carpenters, I'm telling you, you can't get any better than that. Because it reminds me of growing up. It reminds me like, of listening to that as we were opening presents, listening to that as we were decorating the tree, because the music of Christmas becomes part of our history. And I think when God, oh goodness, I think when God knew, when he created us, that music would be important. It would be a way to reach us, that we would be inclined to hearing a message given through music. And it was a beautiful way for us to talk to him in worship and talk about him with others. It's a way of bringing all of us together. Somehow we know the notes and we know the song and we feel comfortable and we all start breathing at the same time. We all start thinking at the same time what comes next. It unifies us. He provides the notes, he inspires the words and conversations to him and about him happen. And so it makes perfect sense that just as music plays a key part in our Christmas experience each year, it would also play a very key part in the very first Christmas. Now the songs, as Rochelle said, there are scripture songs all throughout the Gospel of Luke in the Christmas story. They're not our traditional carols, but they're spontaneous moments of pure worship in response to the news of the Christ child. And so over the next few weeks, we're going to be going through them, and we're going to be talking about what do we hear in these songs? What does it tell us about who God is, and how should it inspire our worship? So much of our Christmas music today, it it focuses on us, doesn't it? What, where we will go, what we will do, how we will act, how we will feel, how it makes us feel. But these songs that we're going to be talking about, so Mary and Zacharias in Luke 1, and then in Luke 2, we'll have the angel song and Simeon song. They all focus on God, all of them, and all that he has done and will do through his son. They prepare the listener to know God better. And in knowing God better, as one of the carols says, it inspires the listeners and the singers to prepare him room in their hearts. So today we're going to look at Mary's song. It's found in Luke 1, and it starts in verse 46, if you want to start heading that way. But first, I'm going to go back a little bit further to verse 26, because we want to know why is she singing? We have a good idea, but why does she just randomly break out into song? Because that's different. And what we're going to see is that her ordinary life, very simple, ordinary life becomes extraordinary very quickly. If you look in verse 26 of Luke 1, this will be familiar, but it's good to read. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor in God. Favor has now been said twice, right? That's important. 
And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, and he will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, how will this be, since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth, in her old age, has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with her, who was called barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary's response, she says, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. This is pretty extraordinary, right? This is not a normal day. And while this news is divine, it's supernatural, it's extraordinary that Mary is taking in, once the angel leaves, she does something very normal. She goes and talks about the fact that she's pregnant and will be pregnant and talks to her relatives about that. Usually this is news you share with people, right? So that's a very normal thing for her to want to go to Elizabeth and share the news. She travels to see her not knowing other than just from the words of the angels, not having a confirmed sight that Elizabeth was also pregnant. The miraculous had also happened in her. And without even saying their first greeting, Elizabeth confirms the angel's message in Mary. She just hears her knock at the door. And in verse 42, this is what she exclaims. Elizabeth exclaimed with a loud cry, if you want to look there. She says, blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what she was spoken to her from the Lord. She says, you're blessed because you believe. This is going to happen to fulfillment. And that is why Mary bursts into song in verse 46. Now, we have to remember that prior to these passages with the angels' messages, God had been quiet for a very long time. Corey mentioned that. There's this huge expanse of time between the Old Testament and the New Testament, and the people had been waiting for their Savior for 400 years. There was a block of silence with no news, no new prophecies, nothing additional, no reassurance that God would speak to them again. The silence was deafening. And they were no longer under the oppression of Babylon, but now they were under the thumb of Rome. So they're still feeling pressed, constricted, in pain. And they're asking over and over again during this huge time frame, how long do we have to wait? Where is God's promised peace? Where is God? Where is he? This is the context behind Mary's praise. It had been a long wait generational waiting. It is so much bigger than we can even imagine because through the angel's message and Elizabeth's confirmation, God is declaring to Mary, your waiting, your people's waiting is done. God is now speaking. I am speaking to you. And what does she do? She hears, she believes, and then she gives praise. So I want to look at her praise first, and I want to first look at it with the eyes of how does this help us to know God more, and what is he like? And then after that, I want to look at the praise and a response, how does this change my heart and transform me when God interacts with me? So first, let's look at verse 46. What is God like? And Mary says this in verse 46, my soul glorifies the Lord. And my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior, for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed, for the mighty one has done great things for me. Holy is his name. Right there, she gives us a really good picture of what God is like. He is mindful, and he is also mighty. 
Mary is experiencing both attributes of his character, and so she wants to declare both of them in her song of praise. So first, let's look at God as mindful. She says, he's been mindful of me. Her song starts very personal. He is personally looking upon me. He has regard. He gazes upon me with favor. Mindful here means that someone is looking at you with loving care. And she's saying, he is doing that directly to me right now. He is making the decision to turn his eyes towards me, and he is specifically noticing me. And it's not because I'm so great. She says, his lowly, humble servant. She's saying, he loves me right where I'm at. That's what Mary is experiencing Think of her, how many people in her life, and you gotta think in the context of the time, a young girl, right? Most likely not having a lot as far as finances. Most likely because she was a woman, she was not regarded well. Who really was being mindful of her? Maybe her parents, maybe a few, but there weren't many people that were turning to gaze their eyes on her. In the world, she was counted as insignificant. She would have a full understanding of her own personal smallness. And yet in God's eyes, she is aware that her creator finds value in her. He looked at me. He's mindful of me. But she doesn't stop there. While there's an affirmation of God's personal regard for her, she declares that through her, he is actually mindful to everybody. He is mindful to all, all of her people. He is speaking to all of them. He looks upon them and has mercy and compassion. His mindfulness is not just thinking, it is an action. He is coming to save them. Verse 50, his mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. He acts on the behalf of those who have reverence towards him for generations. This shows that his mindfulness is merciful, but also it's unchanging. Think about one Christmas season to the next. From one year to the next, everything can change, right? Even like the tree you put up, right? Last year I had a pre-lit tree that I cut all the lights off. This year it's different, right? Little things change. Big things change. Who you celebrate with. You're a year older. So much in our life changes. What is the only thing that is unchanging? God. He is unchanging from generation to generation. God is mindful of those who fear him. That means those who understand with great reverence that we need him. He answers their specific needs with mercy. And how does he do this? Mary tells us in verse 52. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble, the poor in spirit. I added that last part because humble does, it's talking about the poor, but not financially poor, the poor in spirit. She's talking about those that understand their great need for a savior. We read about that in Matthew 5, 3, blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. God answers those who understand that they need him with his kingdom. I need him desperately. And he says, I am answering you by giving you a kingdom. In verse 53, he has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. And again in Matthew 5, verse 6, it says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. If you took righteousness and substituted in Jesus, because it's the same, and say, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for Jesus, they will be satisfied. If you're hungry for him, he will fill you up. He fills us with good things, our salvation and eternal life with him. But we have to be hungry for him. And he's doing this and has done this for generations and will continue to do so for generations. His mindfulness has not stopped and it will not stop. It just keeps going. Verses 54 uh, 54 and 55, it says, He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised our ancestors. That's what God is like. He is mindful. He is personally involved with his creation. He knows our names. He knows the things that weigh on us daily. He sees our joys and he sees our disappointments. He knows what makes our hearts sing the way Mary did so many years ago because he is mindful of us. 
But his mindfulness, his fond, loving care, his nearness, it doesn't diminish the fact that he is also mighty because she talks about that too. God being mighty means that his mindfulness goes beyond just feeling compassion for someone, feeling mercy, feeling love. Because he is mighty, those feelings become actions. He can do something about it. Because he is mighty, he can do more than feel for us. He can save us. For he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed. And verse 49 says, For the mighty one has done great things for me. Holy is his name. Mighty here in Greek, it means he is able to do something. He is able. That was the first word it talked about. He is able when no one else is. He has the power to do something. He can and he will save us. He can and will keep his promises. He is mighty and he is mindful. But then we get to a verse like 51 and things get a little confusing. If you look at verse 51, it says, he has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. And when we read that verse in Mary's song, it might seem like the might and the mindfulness in God's character are in conflict with one another. How can God be mindful and loving and caring and still scatter people? How does that work? In the same breath, how can he send them away? How can he scatter them? How can he leave them empty? Well, you gotta think about who is he scattering? He's scattering the proud. He's scattering those who have no interest in a need for him. He is emptying out those who aren't looking for them because he wants them to understand their need. He wants them to look at themselves and say, I have needs that I cannot meet, that this world cannot meet, only God can. God uses his might in this way because he is mindful because of his great love for even the most rebellious heart. It's not done to exercise his anger. You deserve this. I'm going to punish you. No, he is using everything in his arsenal to convince the proud of what is real because they are blind to the truth that they desperately, we desperately need him to save us. And that's why God was quiet for so long prior to the arrival of Christ on earth because some scattering, some emptying, some pruning on his people needed to happen. People had to understand their need for the gospel, the good news, and that was gonna take some time and it might be painful. But just because God was quiet during those many years doesn't mean he doesn't care or he was inactive or he had checked out. No, the whole time he is working, he is planning, he is providing in his timing so that the hearts would be prepared for the good news of his son. But the story doesn't end there for those that would have been scattered. He doesn't just say, I'm gonna scatter you and that's it. Those who have been brought down, those who have been pruned, because once they see their need, those that he has scattered, those that he has given them what they want, if they can get to the realization of seeing, I have needs, you can meet my needs, Lord, meet my needs. What does the Lord do every time? He meets us with mercy every time. He doesn't say, well, I'm sorry, I'm done. My resources are tapped out for you. He would never say that. He is merciful. And so he meets us every time. He meets every heart that was turned this way. And when they turn back, he says, I will meet you with my mercy. He answers our cries for help with his son. So what is God like? He is perfectly mindful and he is perfectly mighty. And his desire is to use his power to save his beloved creation. So that's what God is like. That's what she's telling us. But how do we respond to the truth? that the great and mighty is the one who saves us, who loves us and calls us to draw near. What do we do with that today? Because that message isn't new. The scripture isn't new, we've read it before. But what do we do with this? 
Well, something we haven't talked about today in this song is how connected her song was and how rich it was in Old Testament scripture. Throughout her song, she's actually reflecting other portions of scripture. She is reflecting and mirroring Hannah's song from uh, Samuel when she was praising as she dedicated her son Samuel, whose name actually means because I asked the Lord for him. Hannah sings this song in 1 Samuel verses 1 and 2 and she says, <clears throat> My heart rejoices in the Lord. In my Lord, my horn is lifted high. My mouth boasts over my enemies and I delight in your deliverance. There is no one holy like the Lord and there is no one beside you. There is no rock like our God. And then she goes on to talk about how God lifts the humble and brings down those that don't need him, those that rebel. It's just like Mary's song. Mary knows her scripture and she's calling it into her memory for that moment. The Lord does great things for those who call on his name. Both Mary and Hannah knew and understood, I need to be delivered. Our people need to be delivered. We need a savior. Mary knows the promises made to her people revealed to Abraham and the generations that have followed. She knows her history. And so because of that, her praise is saturated with scripture. Her understanding of God didn't just come from her interaction with the angel. It didn't just come in that moment that now, oh, I understand now. In fact, what the angel did was just confirmed what she had already taken into her heart as truth. She wasn't choosing in that moment, I will believe now. She'd already chosen, I believe in the one true God, the God who prevails and promises to restore my people, to restore me. She didn't just know her scripture, she believed it, even before the angel came on the scene. It transformed her. She understood who God was, and she knew what he had said in his word, and she believed the truths he had revealed. And she understood that this was part of God's redemptive plan. She didn't deserve his mindfulness, his blessing, but she received his grace with great humility and joy and reverence. Her heart was prepared for it because she was so deeply rooted in scripture, in, her, in the word, God's word. Mary's song shows us who God is, but it also shows us how to respond when God calls on us because there will be times when the extraordinary invades into our very ordinary lives. It's called the work of the Holy Spirit. It should be happening all the time. When God calls on us, when the extraordinary power of God's love invades our very small, often broken lives, what Mary's song does is it gives us a picture of faith. She was grounded in scripture well enough to know God's story, well enough to know God's character. She knew his redemptive plan well enough to know that she desperately, her people desperately needed a savior. And all of this knowing and believing that had happened before the angel came, it gave her the resolve to be faithful. It gave her her foundation so that she could say yes to her part in it, to be God's servant, to submit to his will. And then the great thing was, after she said yes, she was very vocal about it. This world wants us to keep our faith as private as possible. Keep it to yourself. Mary chose not to. She chose not to just whisper, do you wanna hear what happened to me? Just not whisper it in quiet messages. She could not contain the joy of the Lord in her, using her, his loving care and might and mindfulness, working to save her, that she had to break out in song. She declared unashamedly that knowing God's character is something more than understanding. It is to be experienced. That her mindful and mighty God is active and involved in the lives of his children. And she lifted him up in song, out loud, with words. And what were the words that came out? Scripture. Guys, when we have this beautiful message, God is working in your life. If you have chosen to receive him as your king of kings, if you've chosen to put your faith and trust in the saving work of Jesus Christ alone, you have a message that is not to be kept private. It is a public thing. Now you might go, I'm not gonna sing out loud in song. People will look at me like I'm crazy town. I get that. But that same excitement 
and that same joy that could not be contained in Mary, we have that as well. Now other things get clouded and get in the way and we get busy and at Christmas time we get extra busy. But that joy and excitement, God is mindful of me. The God who created the mountains chose to turn his eyes towards me and be my savior. That cannot be contained. Don't damper it. Don't let fear, don't let, well, I don't know enough of the word. Be what stops you. Saturate your life. Saturate your heart with the word. And I'm telling you, you not, might not have it memorized, but with the Holy Spirit working in you, when it's the right time, he will call up the right word that you need to speak in that moment. He will if you trust him. Can I share one more thing with you today really quick? Well, I'm going to do it anyway. I know I asked, but you're here anyway. When I was going through the Greek translation of the word mighty, in this passage, it actually had two definitions or uses in scripture. So the first one was the might of God that we just talked about. He is able to do the impossible. He is able, he is powerful, he is mighty. And then there was another definition that was just a little bit farther down. And it was what we experience when we are mighty in soul. So God is mighty, he is able. When we are mighty in soul, when the Holy Spirit is in our lives, empowering us to do what would otherwise be impossible, this is what it says. To be mighty in soul means to bear or withstand calamities and trials with fortitude and patience. God is mighty, and when his Holy Spirit makes my, me mighty, I can withstand, bear anything with fortitude, which means my feet are planted, I'm not going anywhere, and patience. I can withstand 400 years of quiet, of pruning with fortitude and patience when I remember God is mindful of me. He is mighty. I hope he doesn't prune me for 400 years, right? But he is doing that for me so I can withstand anything. Why do you think Mary was able to say that? Because she is mighty in soul. Because she trusted. Because she believed. She knew the scripture. She believed in her mighty God. And so with fortitude and patience, she said, yes, so it be with me. Because God loves us and because he is mighty, he will provide for us the strength to not only say yes to his will and his ways, but to actually live our submission out every single day. Because he is mighty, I can share his word with boldness and joy. Because he is mighty, I can withstand my difficulties. Because he is mighty, I can be powerful in him. Yes, I'm aware of my smallness in this world, but God looks at me and finds value in me and calls me to do his great work. To be able to rejoice and lift him up even when we are scared or hurting or disappointed and to do so with fortitude and patience, we can be faithful because he is faithful to us. But in order to be faithful, in order to experience strength and peace and a joy that is not of us, we have to know God. What is he like? I have to know him. I have to want to know him. I have to hunger for him. I have to see my need for him. So maybe this Christmas for the first time, or perhaps once again, you need to take time to know God better. I need to know him. I need to be satisfied in him. I need to know his story. I need to know his character. I need to know his plan and promise to save. And all of that knowing, I need to experience it and believe it. I need to magnify God with my love and obedience and my submission to do his will. And I need to lift him up and say, holy is his name. Now, Melanie's gonna come up and sing a song that basically is Mary's Mary's song. She talks about how there's this darkness, but a great light is coming for all people. But then she gets to a point where she says, but he's mighty for me. He who is mighty is mighty 
for me. I feel weak, inadequate. I am not up for it. I have sinned and I've messed up and I'm broken and I feel my smallness probably more than anybody else does, right? Those are things that we all experience. But what does God say? I am mindful of you. Trust me, I love you. And I can do something about my love for you. Let me be mighty for you. And so as she sings that this morning, first of all, take some time to experience, has this mindful and mighty God become my personal savior? Don't leave today without first having that conversation. Have I asked him to be my personal savior? Am I trusting in the saving work of Jesus Christ? Am I asking him to be a part of my life, to be my whole life? Because the, the smallness that I feel, the brokenness that I feel, it's consuming. But I wanna see something better. I wanna understand God's love for me. I wanna understand who God is. That's a conversation to have today. Come find me, come find Corey, come pray at the altar, whatever you need to do. But if that's something that you are experiencing, what does your praise look like? When God comes into our life, when the supernatural, when the extraordinary invades my ordinary life, how do I respond? With thanks, with joy, with a message to declare, do I break out into song? That is something to pray about as well. Take some time today just to reflect, really just meditate on these words. He who is mighty is mighty and mindful for each one of us because he loves us and he can do something about that love for us.